the historical roots of the rapidly expanding cult of Mary with the worship of ancient goddesses and other pagan practices have been examined in an earlier chapter. Such links now seem to strengthen what we assumed before, or even proved before. The New Age movement is undoubtedly advancing on many fronts, not least in the church which will not endure sound doctrine having itching ears. Many Christians have drunk deep drafts of New Age potions. For example, holistic health, hypnosis, yoga, inner healing, meditation, psychical research and awareness training and many have invited new doctrines and heresies based on the humanistic and positive thinking of Taylor de Chardin, Norman Winston Peel and others which provide the church with its emphasis on an earthly kingdom now, the social gospel and society reconstructed for Christianized with kingdom principles for the Lord's return. Restorationist leader Bryn Jones, writing in the beginning of 1991, promised his followers that, quote, by the power of his spirit, we will bring all that is against God and man beneath Christ's authority. God's church will be the most influential body of people on earth in the final period of this age. Unquote. This is indeed a prophetic word, but it is fulfilled in scripture only by the apostate church of the book of Revelation. Hello and welcome everybody to a new video from Joggler 66, Hour of the Truth. This video is called, Who are these Protestants? It deals with Chapter 21 of All Roads Lead to Rome, the Ecumenical Movement by Michael de Semlian, published in 1993, and is the last of the 21 chapters in the book. We have seen so far learning about the background of ecumenism and seeing what the ecumenical movement was all about, where it was started, where it was founded, in which direction it go. We have read in chapter 2 about the Roman Catholic doctrine and the Mass and the Virgin Mary in the next chapter and tradition in the next chapter. All these wrong teachings that the Roman Catholic Church upholds and wherewith it holds with the little truth they sell next to that, they hold Roman Catholics in the Satanic Churches. We are speaking about ecumenical dangers and the papacy and political power, and we are making the point again and again and again that the Roman Catholic Church is just the pagan Roman Empire baptized, and in the first place is a political, not a spiritual power. We have seen the ways paved towards so-called unity with multi-faith and the New Age. We have seen how Protestantism became under, si came under siege. We have seen how the Vatican works below the surface, what the real papal power is, and the Jesuits, how they are working today. We have discussed martyrs and saints, and we found out that a lot of the so-called saints of the Roman Catholic Church, a lot of so-called martyrs of the Roman Catholic Church, actually were, what's the right word for that, actually were traitors. Traitors of the name of Christ, of course, in the first place, but also traitors to the country they live in, because they pay their allegiance in the first place to the Pope of Rome and not to the country they are supposed to serve people from whom they are supposed to be elected from and whom they are supposed to represent. We are learning about the persecutions and the Inquisition, the concern of Roman Catholics and we were sounding the alarm in the name of Protestantism. We were looking at the pace of ecumenical progress 
Peace and Evangelization 2000 plans for the end of last century and the uh, last millennia between 1990 and the year 2000 with all the different actions that were taken there. And then we were looking at the very profound and interesting chapter 19 that I read together with Tom Fress on Bible prophecy and Bible versions. Finally we saw on chapter 20 another gospel and how can I be converted to Christ? So we have arrived now at chapter 21. Who are these Protestants? On page 208 in the book All Roads Lead to Rome by Michael de Semlian. <coughs> so, who are these Protestants? Those who follow Christ as his disciples, sinners saved by grace, believe in the power of prayer. Scripture confirms their belief. Quote, the effectual fervent prayer of a righteous, of a righteous man availeth much. Unquote. As we can read in James, chapter five, verse sixteen. They know. Protestants, Christians true to scripture. They know that they have been redeemed through the shed blood of Christ and born again of his spirit. They believe that Christ came to die for them so that they might live entirely for him. The wonderful assurance of salvation is the very basis of their lives. They find that they hate sin and love Christ. They are not religious and dislike ritual. They recognize only two God-ordained sacraments, baptism and the Lord's Supper, for those who have been born again into a new life in Christ. They seek to be led by one spirit and base their convictions on one book, and that one book is the Bible, the 1611 authorized version of King James Bible. They believe in the God who heals and does miracles, when he is in his sovereign majesty proposes to do so. They may or may not believe that all the gifts of the Spirit are for today, compared with the great truth of, for, which they, uh, for which they contend, such differences in the interpretation of Scripture are of small account. They are open to other points of view and always alive and receptive to what God might do. They are discerning and alert to deception and infiltration. Quote, For I know this, that after my departing shall grievous wolves enter in among you, not sparing the flock. Unquote. From the book of Acts, chapter 20, verse 29. When not actually persecuted for their beliefs, they tend to be seen as a sectarian, as conservative to the extent of being negative as well as bigoted and sometimes unloving. John Kennedy, the Scottish Highland evangelist, wrote, quote, No Christian can be true and faithful, on whose brow the world should not brand the name bigot. But let him bear it. It is a mark of honor, though intended to be a brand of shame. In every age from the beginning, when the cause of truth emerged triumphant from the din and dust of controversy, the victory was won by a band of bigots who were sworn to its defense. Unquote. Let C. H. Spurgeon be their spokesman. Quote, I believe, and glory in that which at present is so much spoken against, sectarianism. If a man be earnest about truth, he will be sectarian. When we cease to strive, seek, contend and maintain the truth, it will cease in our land and error alone shall reign." Unquote. The Bible describes these servants of God as saints and as a royal priesthood when you read 1 Peter chapter 2 verse 9. But they never amount to much in their own eyes. Only Christ matters to them. One among the greatest of them expressed this for all in his letter to the Philippians. For to me life is Christ and to die is gain, i.e. more of him. 
wrote the Apostle Paul in Philippians chapter 1 verse 21 and quote, I am crucified with Christ, nevertheless I live, yet not I, but Christ lives in me, unquote, as Paul wrote down in Galatians chapter 2 verse 20. After all, the Lord had made it clear enough. Whosoever will come after me, let him deny himself, take up his cross, and follow me, as we can read in Mark 8, verse 34. A handful of Christians without political power and without armies, and certainly without sectarian violence or retaliation, changed the world again and again. God acted and God was glorified. Their successors are among us today, a remnant, scattered and often isolated among the denominations. Quote, this is the church which does the work of Christ on earth, unquote, wrote Bishop J.C. Ryle. Quote, its members are a little flock, and few in number, one or two here, two or three there, a few in this district and a few in that. But these are they who shake the universe, who change the fortune of kingdom by their prayers. These are they who are the active workers for speaking the knowledge of pure religion and undefiled. These are the lifeblood of the country, the shield, the defense, the stay, and the support of any nation to which they belong." Unquote. Controversy in religion, as Bishop Ryle reminded the Church, is a hateful thing. Quote, it is hard enough to fight the devil, the world and the flesh without private differences in our own camp. But there is one thing that is even worse than controversy, and that is false doctrine tolerated and permitted without protest and molestation. It was controversy that won the battle of the Protestant Reformation, if the views which some men hold were correct, it is plain that we ought not to have had a reformation at all. For the sake of peace, we should have gone on worshipping the Virgin and bowing down to images and relics to this day. The Apostle Paul was the most divisive and controversial character in the entire book of, book of Acts, and because of it, he was beaten with rods, stoned and left as dead, chained and left in a dungeon, dragged before magistrates, barely escaped assassination, and so pronounced in him were his convictions that it came to a point when the unbelieving Jews in Thessalonica declared, These that have turned the world upside down are come hither also. God pity those pastors whose main objective is the growth of their organizations and whose main concern lest their boats be rocked. They may escape involvement and controversy, but they will not escape the judgment seat of Christ." Unquote. We are contending for the faith. One Englishman who, not so very long ago, contended for the faith in the face of enormous controversy was John Kensett. Now I don't have the time to go during the reading of this last chapter of the book into who John Kensett was, but um, I will go into that into an hour of the truth broadcast. In the future from now I read this on the 30th of October 2016, so I don't know if that even comes out before this chapter comes out. But there I will introduce to you who John Kensett was, so you, you can get to know him. His protest in, 19, in, sorry, his protest in 1898 at St. Cuthbert's Church was the most famous of many that he made over what the Archbishop of Canterbury and others of that day later referred to at an ecclesiastical inquiry into Kensett's death as grievous departures from the reformed position of the English Church. Kensett was assassinated in Liverpool. A sharp instrument was plunged into his eye during a mission that he was, a le that he was leading with the newly formed Wycliffe preachers in that city. Writing in 1902, just after Kensett died as a martyr for the truth, Reverend J.C. Wilcox caught the spirit of this man of God in describing the famous protest at St. Cuthbert's. Quote, 
the beacon fires of 1588 have died down. Their ashes are scattered to the four winds. But other fires of the same century have never gone out. No, nor ever can. The martyr fires of the glorious reformation are burning still. The spirit of the martyrs is still unconsumed. The candle lighted at many a stake has never been put out. Little did I know that at the very hour when Wilcox was reading a draft of the first edition of the Beacon Fire, on Good Friday, 1898, in a West End church, a man whose spirit was ablaze with the flame from the altar fires of truth, and in whose bones there burned the consuming fire of righteous indignation at untruth and idolatry, a man whose lips had been touched with the live coal from of the martyr's fires of the Reformation, Little did I dream that at that now notorious church of St. Cuthbert's, Philbeach Gardens, Kensington, one brave soul was giving the signal for a national rekindling of the Reformation candle. That brave man was John Kensett. And what had he done? He had attended St. Cuthbert's church in company with Miss Kensett and his son, a Roman service known as the Adoration of the Cross. In that service, the vicar, after uncovering the veiled crucifix, said, quote, Behold the wood of the cross. Unquote. To this the congregation responded, Come, let us adore it. Then the clergy, and next two by two, the congregation crawled to the crucifix, which had been laid on the, ca uh, on the chancel steps, and prostrate kisses the figures thereon. Then it was one man, whose spirit was stirred within him, at his unblushing idolatry in a parish church, felt the force of a divine call. He seized the crucifix, and upholding it aloft in the face of the idolaters, said clearly and solemnly, and in words befitting a Hebrew prophet, In the name of God I denounce this idolatry in the Church of England. God help me. The trumpet blast of a second reformation in England's church had sounded forth. From St. Cuthbert's it was destined to re-echo in every parish church in the land. Thousands and thousands of sober and conscientious and loyal sons of the national church who had been alienated from the church of their forefathers rallied at the call. The forces of Protestantism, fainting and well-nigh sick <coughs> sick at heart for the encroachments of sacerdotalism within their beloved church, sprang round the standard of the Reformation. Unquote. This comes from Contending for the Face by Rev. J. C. Wilcox from the Protestant Truth Society that Mr. Kensett founded. Were Ryle and Kensett and other great men of faith alive today, they would scarcely recognize the popular and comfortable form of evangelical Christianity, which celebrates at every opportunity and merely seeks the world's approval, instead of confronting it with its sin and need for the Savior. They would be horrified by the accommodation with false religion, knowing that this must undermine and even and eventually destroy the very foundation of so many lives. If the foundations be destroyed, what can the righteous do? As we can read in Psalm 113. They would deplore the weak and equivocal leadership with, which coexists with so many false doctrines and causes so much confusion among believers, while hundreds of millions of Anglicans Orthodox and Catholics head towards a Christless eternity. Because they were making compromises to the Church of Satan. That's why the Anglicans and the Orthodox, of course together with the Catholics who didn't wake up to the Biblical truth, head towards a Christless eternity. In this little sentence, Ralph Woodrow answers the question about the ecumenical movement, All Roads Lead to Rome, that is actually the undertitle in Germany, Evangelicals, Where to 
Where do you go to? Where do you end? Well, in this little sentence, he answers that. They end towards a Christless eternity. God spoke the world into existence, and Christians proclaim their faith with the spoken word. If thou shalt confess with thy mouth the Lord Jesus, and shalt believe in thine heart that God has raised him from the dead, thou shalt be saved. As we can read in Romans 10, verse 9. There are no private Christians, none who have not declared their faith before men. Whosoever therefore shall be ashamed of me and of my words, in this adulterous and sinful generation, said Jesus, of him also shall the Son of Man be ashamed, as we can read in Mark chapter 8. Those who speak up actively oppose and take a stand against all compromise of biblical truth, earnestly contend for the faith which was once delivered unto the saints, as we can read in Jude chapter 3. Those who speak up actively oppose and take a stand against all compromise of biblical truth earnestly contend for the faith which was once delivered unto the saints. A very profound sentence in this book as we come very close to the end. They may be a scattered people. Don't forget, we are still talking about who are these Protestants. They may be a scattered people, as were the Christians in Asia to whom Peter wrote his first letter, or those to whom Bishop Ryle referred. Like their courageous forebears, surrounded by so much falsehood, confusion and compromise, they are prepared to stand their ground, holding out the light of the gospel to the deceived millions on the broad path to destruction. In an address to the British Evangelical Council in 1969, one among them, and truly a prophetic voice in his generation and beyond, expressed their likely reaction very powerfully with a message as important today as then. Citing the scripture in 1 Corinthians chapter 14 verse 8, quote, For if the trumpet gives an uncertain sound, who shall prepare himself to the battle? Dr. Martin Lloyd-Jones made clear that he believed that the enemy are not just present but rampant in the camp. Sound the alarm, he thundered, sound the alarm. A post Christendom is unifying world religion, which under the surface is as bloodthirsty as it ever was. Once religions of the world combined with the new age to form one great ecumenical and multi-faith monopoly, God's little flock will yet again be as lambs to the slaughter. Wake up is the cry of the watchman. Regardless of the cost, our responsibility is to speak out the truth to all whom we might reach, and redouble our prayers that Christ's words in Matthew 7 verse 22 will not apply to them. Quote, Many will say to me in that day, Lord, Lord, have we not prophesied in thy name? And in thy name have we cast out devils, and in thy name have done many wonderful works. And then I will profess unto them, I never knew you. Depart from me, ye that work iniquity. So far, the book, All Roads Lead to Rome, from Michael the Semlian. And I want to end with Ephesians chapter 2 of the King James Version of the Bible. Because this chapter, I think, is a very good summary of everything that we read and everything that is really important. When we talk about Christ and when we talk about Protestantism and when we talk about true belief. 
Ephesians chapter 2 And you hath he quickened, who were dead in trespasses and sins, wherein in time past ye walked according to the course of this world, according to the prince of the power of the air, the spirit that now worketh in the children of disobedience, among whom also we all had our conversation in times past in the lusts of our flesh, fulfilling the desires of the flesh and of the mind, and were by nature the children of wrath, even as others. But God, who is rich in mercy, for his great love wherewith he loved us, even when we were dead in sins, hath quickened us together with Christ. By grace ye are saved, and hath raised us up together, and has and made us sit together in heavenly places in Christ Jesus, that in the ages to come he might show the exceeding riches of his grace and his kindness toward us through Christ Jesus. For by grace are ye saved through faith, and that not of yourselves, it is the gift of God, not of works, lest any man should boast. For we are his workmanship, created in Christ Jesus unto good works, which God hath before ordained that we should walk in them. Wherefore remember that ye being in times past Gentiles in the flesh, who are called uncircumcision by that which is called the circumcision in the flesh made by hands, that at that time ye were without Christ, being aliens from the commonwealth of Israel, and strangers from the covenants of promise, having no hope, and without God in the world. But now, in Christ Jesus, ye who sometimes were far off, are made nigh by the blood of Christ. For he is our peace, who hath made both one, and hath broken down the middle wall of partition between us, having abolished in his flesh the enmity, even the law of commandments contained in ordinances, for to make in himself of twain one new man, so making peace. And that he might reconcile both unto God in one body by the cross, having slain the enmity thereby, and came and preached peace to you which were afar off, and to them that were nigh. For through him we both have access by one Spirit unto the Father. Now therefore ye are no more strangers and foreigners, but fellow citizens with the saints and of the household of God, and are built upon the foundation of the apostles and prophets, Jesus Christ himself being the chief cornerstone, in whom all the building fitly framed together groweth unto an holy temple in the Lord, in whom ye also are built together for an habitation of God through the Spirit. This concludes Ephesians chapter 2 and my book reading of All Roads Lead to Rome by Michael the Semnian. I hope you've learned, you've enjoyed and you shared this reading with as many friends and family as possible because we all are living in perilous times as Bible-believing Christians in now the last year before the 500th anniversary of the Protestant Reformation from Martin Luther started in 1517. We are really living in the end times and persecution will only be harder and stronger than it has ever been before for the little remnant of God and therefore hold steadfast and hold fast the Bible that one book of truth in our life that you find. There is no other truth but Jesus Christ. And there is no other way but Jesus Christ. I am the way, the truth and the life, Jesus said. Nobody comes to the Father but by me. Not through the veneration of saints, not through the veneration of the Virgin Mary, not by listening to the Pope, not by being part of a congregation, meaning a denomination, not by being part of any church, just for the sake of it, because you don't become Christian by sitting in a church, as you don't become a car by sitting in your garage, either. 
true fellowship it was, is with like-minded. Two or three people here or there, and in their midst, Jesus said, where two or three are gathered in my name, in their midst I will be. That is true fellowship that you should seek. And from that, gain a lot of the power that you need and the strength that you need for the coming war. Remember Daniel. Remember Shadrach, Meshach and Abednego. And when the time comes, I pray that we all can stand as Shadrach, Meshach and Abednego. Until next time. Jogla 66 from Hour of the Truth says, God bless you. Signing off. Bye bye. We, as Bible believing Christians, we know that the hand that is behind ISIS, the hand that is behind Al Qaeda, is the same hand that is behind the United States of America government, that is behind the European Union government, and that is behind all the armies in the world, and that is behind all these um, mercenary companies out in the world, like XE, or formerly called Blackwater, run by Knights of Malta, etc., etc. So this is something that you really have to understand. This is all just a theater. And the point is, where is this theater going to lead to? When you are a Bible-believing Christian, you know that in the end times, Jesus warned us in Matthew 24, there will be wars, wars, and rumors of wars. And we know that the Antichrist, by peace, will destroy many. And so on, and so on, and so on. I could start citing the whole Bible up and down right now with citations like this to tell you what it's all about. But I don't have to sing to the choir or preach to the choir. You as Bible-believing Christians already know that. So the only thing that I ask of you is don't be caught in their game. Because when you are and you play their game, you have to play by their rules. And their rules are not Christ's rules. So the only thing that I can advise you of is, okay, take that information in what happens about there. Pray for the people that these victims are being taken good care of and that they are just deceived people that they maybe have a chance by going through this situation maybe they have a way to find to Christ in this way maybe they have a way to find to the real truth I mean these people are Muslims and coming from Muslim countries and coming to so-called quote-unquote Christian countries of course the Roman Catholic Church is not Christian. Of course the Protestant churches today don't preach any protest anymore. All right, I know that. But still, here and there, it is possible that a grain falls on the ground that can fall on fruitful ground, even with these refugees and the whole situation that is coming up. And that is the hope that we should have as Bible-believing Christians, and that is the prayer that we should use every day when we address our Lord to pray for our enemies as we pray for our friends. Because Jesus said, love your enemies and love your neighbors.